Welcome to Prescription for Justice. My name is Martin Donahue. In this episode, we will meet Kristen Pallack, who is finishing her final year of medical school at Rush Medical College and will begin her internal medicine residency this summer at the Medical College of Wisconsin. I first encountered Kristen when she spoke as the recipient of the Student Activist Award at the American Public Health Association's Activist Dinner. I was impressed by her poise, her passion for social justice, and her commitment to health care for all, regardless of ability to pay. I wanted Kristen as a guest for a number of reasons. One, we covered women in science in a previous episode, and Kristen's path to physician is fascinating and will hopefully motivate other young women and men. Two, she provided research and editorial support for her mentor, Dr. David Anso, on his book, The Death Gap, How Inequality Kills, which speaks to many of the economic, social, and cultural contributors to health and disease that are a theme of this series. And three, she was a key figure in convincing the Illinois legislature that it was not only morally just, but economically sound to provide kidney transplants to undocumented immigrants with end-stage renal disease, who by and large can only access dialysis when they are near death, and who, after emergent cleansing of their blood, are released from the hospital, often without a source of or ability to pay for primary care, only to end up back in the emergency room a week later. First, some facts about immigrants in the United States, who are welcomed in word, if not in deed, by Emma Lazarus's poem at the base of the Statue of Liberty, and who built this country, often as slaves or indentured servants, and who have never been adequately compensated for their labor. There are currently 25 million non-citizens living in the United States. 11 to 12 million of these are undocumented. Moreover, over 60 million people in the U.S. speak a language at home other than English. 80% of undocumented immigrants are in the labor force, where they constitute 40% of agricultural and 20% of meat processing and food service workers. Two-thirds of undocumented immigrants have been in the U.S. for more than 10 years. There are many common myths regarding immigrants, both documented and undocumented. One myth is that they are taking advantage of the American system by free riding and as such constitute a drain on the economy. In fact, evidence shows that all immigrants, documented and undocumented combined, contribute to the U.S. economy in proportion to their share of the population. Undocumented workers provide important services through their labor and pay state and local income taxes, property taxes, excise taxes, and the employer's share of Social Security, as many have Social Security numbers, as well as Medicare and unemployment taxes. Nonetheless, they are not eligible for many public services such as Medicaid, the Supplemental Nutritional Assistance Program, previously known as food stamps, unemployment benefits, housing assistance, temporary cash assistance, free legal help, Social Security, and Medicare. The Social Security Administration estimates that nationwide, undocumented workers contribute $7 billion in Social Security taxes and $1.5 billion in Medicare taxes annually. On average, the National Research Council estimates that each undocumented immigrant will contribute approximately 80,000 more per capita over his or her lifetime than he or she will consume in governmental services. Such workers also contribute to the economy through rental payments and by purchasing goods and services such as food, clothing, and utilities. A 2014 study showed that documented plus undocumented immigrants account for 12.6% of premiums paid to private health insurers, but only 9.1% of insurer expenditures. For immigrants with health insurance, annual premiums exceed care expenditures by over $1,000 per enrollee which offsets a deficit of over $150 per U.S.-born enrollee. For the period 2008 through 2014, the surplus premiums paid by immigrants was $174 billion. Immigrants heavily subsidized Medicare's trust fund. Thus, reducing immigration could seriously undermine Medicare. A second myth is that undocumented immigrants take American jobs. In fact, U.S. unemployment rates have little to do with immigration and have more to do with neoliberal free trade policies that have effectively encouraged American companies to outsource manufacturing and service sector jobs to countries with lower wages, 
fewer taxes, and more lax environmental and occupational health and safety standards. Many corporations support policies that create domestic inequalities, including unfair immigration rules designed to provide a continuous stream of vulnerable workers willing to labor for lower wages than unionized American employees, while simultaneously opposing unions. Despite being a nation of immigrants, a rising tide of nationalism, supported by the rhetoric and policies of our current president and a complicit Republican Party, has led to anti-immigrant violence, the creation of a phony national emergency at the border, and the separation of immigrant families with children being incarcerated in cages. The 1948 Universal Declaration of Human Rights states, everyone has the right to a standard of living adequate for the health and well-being of oneself and one's family, including food, clothing, housing, and medical care. Though many countries have adopted the declaration, the United States government still does not view health care and many other social services as rights for immigrants, nor for that matter for native-born persons. This regressive position perpetuates the precarious circumstances faced by undocumented immigrants who are already vulnerable in terms of poverty, language barriers, occupational and environmental dangers, lack of transportation, and educational, legal, and political marginalization. With that preamble, I am happy to welcome soon-to-be Dr. Kristen Pollack. Kristen, tell us about your background, both academically and as an activist. Hi, Martin. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. I'm, I began actually with my career in anthropology. I was a student in biological anthropology, which a lot of people are not familiar with, I would say. I worked in forensic anthropology, so it's a little bit different than um, doing, going out and doing ethnographic cultural studies. I looked at a lot of bones, a lot of skeletons, um, and archaeological digs, actually. And I started with that in Chicago, and then I actually went to the UK, to England, to further my studies and to do graduate school there. Mm -hmm. And I found pretty quickly um, that while I loved the study of people, it was a little bit limited for what I had wanted to do. And so I thought to myself, how could I make a difference uh, in this world a little bit more than what I was doing? And so I came back to the US, and I decided to apply to medical school after a lot of thought. And upon coming to, back to Chicago and thinking that I wanted to start medical school, I was living in the city and I decided to volunteer at a hospital, which happened to be Rush University Medical Center in Chicago. I had some friends that were here at medical school and they had said that Rush was very engaged with the community and that was something that was important to me. So while I was at Rush, um, I basically started volunteering with patients, doing very small jobs, patient transport, um, language translation services, things like that. And through during that, um, I ran into my now mentor of many years, um, Dr. David Ansel, and he told me he wanted to write a book. He had formerly written a book about his time at Cook County as um, a resident, basically, and afterwards as an attending there in internal medicine. And he talked to me about writing a book about Chicago, about what health disparities existed in Chicago and why they were there and why some people live longer than others. And I jumped at the idea with the idea of studying people, but I didn't know anything about uh, social epidemiology, as he put it. So I decided to learn on the spot, basically, and read a lot of books that he recommended. We went out into the community, met a lot of people, explored a lot of neighborhoods, looked at different types of housing, all sorts of things. So. I became an activist basically on the job. Um, and in, in the sense, I learned how to just show up and, and how important that was to people um, to just lend your support in, in that sense. And, and so, yes, that's kind of how I came to medicine and to activism. Um, for me, I thought that uh, internal medicine was a great way to kind of give back to the community through um, areas like general medicine and primary care. So I've chosen to, to specialize and further my training in that. Um, and I hope that I continue to do that in the future in Milwaukee now in the next coming years. Well, that, that, that's fantastic because certainly we need more primary care physicians and we need more that are attuned to those social and economic and cultural contributors to disease. And I envy you somewhat because 
Uh, I didn't really discover that until uh, I was between residency and fellowship and did a year of traveling work, and that's kind of what opened my eyes to it. But I, I think training has changed these days, and certainly your background. Um, as you went through, what, what were some of the major examples of either uh, um, social injustice or perhaps racism or sexism that you encountered that, that fired you up to do more? I can say that honestly, from a very early age, I felt a little bit more in tune to people around me to some extent. Growing up actually in Northwest Indiana, it's a pretty homogenous community for the most part, but the friends that I had in high school were not like others per se. So my best friend who actually lives in Chicago with me now um, is a Muslim woman and she is now a lawyer, but while we were in um, Northwest Indiana, she did experience quite a bit of racism, I would say, as well as other individuals that were against her being Muslim in general. Mm -hmm. um, things that I had seen were people throwing things at her, rocks included, shouting things from cars when they would pass, asking her, you know, do you have a bomb under your hijab, things mm -hmm. like that. So that was pretty early on in high school when, when I started to encounter that. And coming to Chicago, I noticed there was um, it was different. There was tolerance uh, in terms of a lot more diversity was apparent in Chicago, and I think people were more in tune to being around people that were not quite like them, but racism still obviously is very, very prominent in the city of Chicago, particularly with what is left over from segregation. Um, mm -hmm. Just looking across the city, you have patients that are from the South or the West Sides, and it's um, very much um, a concentrated disadvantage, uh, neighborhoods of concentrated disadvantage um, with African-American neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. And you can see the effects of racism, you know, many times over from whether or not they couldn't rent in certain areas, um, whether or not they could actually buy homes in certain neighborhoods, thanks to historical and um, uh, redlining, which was one of them, which prevented them from actually buying homes in, in neighborhoods. Yeah, so it sounds <laughs> like you, you um, saw some very particular examples of racism. Absolutely. And as you went on through your training, you saw that it was really so pervasive and just institutionalized and, and, and almost legislated into uh, exactly. uh, policies. Um, and you got working with Dr. Ansel on the, the book, and what are some of the main takeaway messages of the book vis-a-vis -vis how the economically disadvantaged suffer both in terms of health and in other ways? So the book is called The Death Gap, How Inequality Kills, which is a, quite a heavy title. Um, but basically, it focuses on life expectancy in the United States. We use Chicago mainly as the example, but it is um, meant to be a national book. And so it looks at life expectancy in relation to where you live, to your zip code, and how that determines how long you'll live in life and the hardships that you'll endure and whether or not, you know, the American dream of people being able to pick themselves up from their bootstraps, basically, and to overcome all of these disadvantages, whether or not they can do that, mm -hmm. and how, you know, this translates into health, you know, mm -hmm. your environment, your access to schools, uh, to food, whether or not you live in a food desert. Um, in Chicago, it's very prevalent on the west side. Um, and also your access to health care was one of them for us. I mean, whether or not you're by a hospital that has an accredited program for cancer treatment or whether or not you're at a place that doesn't have that makes a big difference on the types of treatments that you have available to you. Right. Other things that we looked at was like community efficacy, how much your community was willing to kind of help each other out. And that goes down to the neighborhood level as well as the city of Chicago. Mm -hmm. How you know much was someone from downtown um, going to help someone on the south side if they encountered um, difficulties you know, that someone might be experiencing. So. Yeah, it, it, you're so right. And there's so much data showing that this really uh, has widespread impacts, thinking of things like food deserts and, and supermarkets that carry a wide variety of produce. Um, not being nearby, the lack of transportation. If you own a car, it's, it's not that difficult to drive five or 10 miles to go to Whole Foods to pick up some, some kale. But uh, if you're living in a food desert and, and you have to wait a half hour for the bus and go each way, it's, it's a lot more difficult. Um, data showing that it's more difficult to access necessary pain medications in certain neighborhoods. It's more, ne it's, it's more difficult to access uh, reproductive health care uh, of various types. And that in turn then takes away time, which mm -hmm. takes you away from your job, from childcare, which is yes. often not available. And, and it seems like, as, as you're uh, alluding to, everything sort of snowballs uh, mm -hmm. one after the other. Are, are there plans for a subsequent book, either from you or Dr. Ansel, <laughs> uh, in the works? 
actually funny you should ask uh, he does have a book that he would like to write um, it has gone by many different names but basically um, it looks at how people can get involved the idea of how you learn to speak up against injustices is, is, is his next step. <laughs> right. So we'll come back to that. Now let's uh, focus for a little bit on the problem of end-stage kidney disease um, in undocumented immigrants in particular and your work with the, the legislation that you helped to get passed in Illinois. How did you get involved in that? Uh, how was that work uh, responded to by the various stakeholders and what you ultimately accomplished? Yeah. So the way we got involved with it actually is it ended up on our front door here at Rush. Um, there was a group in Chicago that had gathered together. These were individuals that were receiving um, dialysis from the state. Illinois, um, given the way the Medicaid works here, if you, have, if you are undocumented or uninsured, basically it's based on insurance, not um, citizenship status, you can receive um, dialysis from the state based on Medicaid. That's not the um, case for many other states. Um, I believe there's really only 10 states, maybe 11 at this point with Colorado that will do that, that have extended their Medicaid to consider end-stage renal disease and emergency treatment that can be um, treated that way. And so these were individuals that were already receiving dialysis treatment and they needed transplants though. So these were young individuals. We're talking people in their teens, early 20s, people that could really contribute back to society. Mm -hmm. A lot of them were individuals who had been here in the United States since the early age of even one or even younger. Most of them had not even lived in Mexico to any extent. Mm -hmm. And so they really were in every sense of the word Americans for the most part, not mm -hmm. all of them, but a lot of them. And they felt that they should have access to life-saving treatments the same that anyone else should, including uh, kidney transplants in this case. And so they had found um, a church that's called Our, La Our Lady of Guadalupe, which is uh, in the, uh, the neighborhood of Little Village in Chicago. And they centered around this particular priest who is named as um, Father Londa Verde. And he said, I can help you. By gathering them, by doing protests uh, in the media and whatnot, they could make a difference. Mm -hmm. And so they came and they protested outside different medical centers and were turned away from most of them, um, except for at Rush. And this was back in about 2013, I believe. They came to our door, they protested. This was right before Christmas, actually. And instead of telling them to go away and calling security, we invited them in and we talked to them. And Dr. Imagine Ansel, that. <laughs> yes, exactly. So Dr. Ansel went down, talked to them, and we thought, you know, what can we do? We can't do more than listen at this point. But he said, I will talk with the senior leadership and see if we can, in fact, donate a kidney or two. And they were shocked that anyone would even pay attention to them, to be honest. Mm -hmm. um, they were very, very thankful. And from that, Rush actually did agree, um, based on charity care, to give away two transplants based on the circumstances that an individual would be able to provide their own donor, mm -hmm. which is very important at this point because they're not able to be on a list, for instance. Mm -hmm. So these two individuals were able, um, did bring their own donor mm -hmm. and they were transplanted and the care was covered by Charity Care by Rush and we mm -hmm. found a way to basically cover the medications for these two individuals um, for their long-term treatment. But that wasn't really a solution mm -hmm. <laughs> for the rest of everybody. And so from that, we decided at Rush that we would continue to transplant as many people as we could, but that other medical centers needed to be involved. And so we discussed how we would do that. Um, many of the other medical centers were opposed to this idea, given the, the funding that would be required to cover it, as well as um, it wasn't so much that it's an undocumented status that they're concerned about. It's more or less the uninsured status because someone needs to be a good steward of the organ if they are given a transplant, which includes being able to afford all of the uh, medications afterwards for the rest of your life uh, effectively. And if I might interject here, this sort of builds on the work of Paul Farmer and Jim Kim and others, the, the fact that uh, you can take people who are much in much more dire circumstances than, than some of the undocumented immigrants in this country uh, who have things like multidrug resistant tuberculosis and HIV and healthcare can work with them if you if you involve them in their care and, and yeah. you provide this so-called preferential option for the poor. So I'll, I'll let you resume, but I, I, I like the way that fits into that, that historical example. Absolutely. And these individuals were actually quite responsible. Um, they you know, were more than willing to work with us to raise as much money as they could on their own. It's just the fact that covering it um, still posed a bit of a problem in terms of institutions being able to accept perhaps that risk. Mm -hmm. um, because for an institution, they have to be able to have a certain number 
of transplant um, patients survive and not um, pass away within the first few years or so. Otherwise, it threatens their uh, status to remain a transplant center. Mm -hmm. So that's the risk that they have to take in this case. And so we um, established a summit, basically, of institutions. We called them around the table and we said, could you send um, someone from your senior leadership as well as transplant surgeon or anyone that would be involved with that care? And most institutions in the Chicagoland region with the transplant program did show. And so we had a discussion. We established a task force around it um, that was um, centered in downtown Chicago, where everyone would come about once a month, myself included, and we would talk around the table um, in terms of, you know, what would be a solution that we could perceive working in this case. And what we got was institutions based on charity care to donate a certain number of organs based on what they can um, handle and the size of their program each year. Mm -hmm. and whether or not that would have covered enough people that were currently on the list. And we found that it could, to a certain extent, um, the Gift of Hope, which is the main um, kidney um, agency that works with us in the Midwest with um, donations, also was around the table. Um, the CEO was a, a wonderful individual that um, really cared about this cause, and they were willing to work with us, including like the aftercare as well, and donating um, money. And so we came up with the idea of of having a fund that everyone could pay into for this. At the same time, we thought this is not something that was sustainable per se. Mm -hmm. And we kind of capitalized on the fact that uh, Medicaid expansion was happening in Illinois at the same time. There were two individuals um, that were very helpful for this. Um, Eddie Acevedo, um, he is in the Senate, I believe. And then the House, um, in the House we had Cynthia Soto. And both of them were willing to take on this cause to go down state and to kind of advocate for us as well. And from those two, we ended up having um, Senate bill, which is 741, which was passed allowing us um, to actually transplant individuals using the Medicaid funds that would have gone towards dialysis to do it towards transplant because we proved um, basically that it would save the state money. The fact is to do um, dialysis over the a person's life is actually quite expensive. Mm -hmm. Each year, it rounded out to be around $80,000 or so. And over the time that an individual is on dialysis, you were looking up to even $500,000 for an individual mm -hmm. versus a one-time transplant. And even when you were covering the immunosuppressive medication afterwards, it still factored out to be cheaper. Mm -hmm. So using that reasoning, they were actually able to convince the state and to push it through. And then on the same side um, with uh, Senator Acevedo, Basically, we argued that we needed to um, create a different task force within the state to look at this issue even further. And so there was House Joint Resolution 98 that basically created that task force. The issue being, at the time, we had a Republican governor who did not want to move forward with any of this legislation. So while it still exists and it has not been able to be revoked, the funding is still there. Um, no individuals had been able to be transplanted under that legislation, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Now, the fact is we do have a Democratic governor now in Illinois, and so that may be on the table to be discussed further is what we're hoping um, currently. But what we, we did in the meantime is create a fund, basically, that each institution pays into, and the institutions being the academic medical centers, the gift of hope, and certain pharmaceutical agencies. Um, to cover the immunosuppressive medication afterwards. So through this particular kidney fund in Illinois, we've been able to transplant about 125 individuals. Fantastic. And I imagine using a lot of the same reasoning that this could potentially be applied to other solid organ transplants, uh, certainly kidney or the vast bulk of solid organ transplants, but imagine uh, continuously readmitting patients for congestive heart failure only to diuresis or get the fluid out of their lungs and have them come back over and over again every couple of weeks, it's, it's, it's would be cost saving, not to mention, of course, the morally right thing to do. Right. Um, my hope is too that what you've done, and um, we'll have to get you back on another time to discuss maybe in a few years how this might be turned into a national model, but I'd like to know what, um, what, can, the, what can other physicians, medical students, and just our viewers, members of the general public nationwide, what can they do to advocate for the health care of undocumented immigrants and in general and for these types of programs? Absolutely. I think um, in general, it's important to be present and to show up. The one thing that I always kind of talk about now that I didn't know when I first started was, you know, how do you create change? And the thing that I come back to now is you need a narrative 
you need data, and then you need to actually take action, and you need to show up. The narrative comes from the patients themselves, from their stories. You can kind of connect with them. For me, it was actually going out to the protests and talking to these individuals and seeing how they reacted to us, even just lending our support. There were two women in particular I could think of that just started crying on the spot because we had just taken the time to show up. Um, and then you look at the data. Um, we looked at you know how much this was costing the state, how we can inter, um, intervene, how, you know, all of the different changes that could come about, and we acted on it. We did more than just stay within the realm of a clinic, and I think that's important for doctors as well as other people to think of, or people to think about. With, uh, with health, you're, it goes beyond the clinic. It goes into the community and the environment and whatnot, and it's important for doctors or other health professionals, I think, to engage within the community with volunteer work, with uh, anything else that could be related to that. For other individuals, it's important to, I think, remove stigma, and that's how people can kind of make a difference. Um, to advocate you know, in your own cities to make places a sanctuary city, I think, is important to make sure that healthcare institutions cannot have ICE agents um, serve warrants basically within an institution. I believe that a healthcare institution um, mm. should be more or less like a sanctuary right. um, uh, a site. And I think that, you know, if, if the people within the institution can advocate towards that and to kind of make that a culture of an institution, I think that's important. Mm -hmm. And I think people at home in general, you know, whether or not it's someone who's undocumented versus someone who's just plain uninsured, which is many Americans these days still, even with the Affordable Care Act, or someone who's homeless, someone, any of those kinds that hold stigma, I think if you can learn to understand these people's stories, if you can understand that they are not so different from yourself, that actually makes a difference in itself. That in itself can almost be activism. Right. And as human beings, it's important to remember that we're all linked in suffering and illness and death. And all it takes is one abnormal mammogram or one abnormal absolutely. colonoscopy to change your life and, and put you in the exact same circumstances as everyone else and that we're, we're all human beings. And how we live, um, how our suffering is responded to, um, how we approach death is uh, an important measure of the type of society and the type of species that we are. Yes. Um, I, I also think it's important to note that uh, folks should sign their owner organ donor cards. Um, Absolutely. <laughs> so. Yes, I will just say the one thing that has um, come out of this is when people in their own community can see that their people are getting transplants, it makes them more likely to donate to the system as a whole. So organ donation in Illinois has actually increased since um, we've been doing this, especially within the Latino community. And on top of it, um, given the fact that driver's licenses were um, available to the undocumented starting around 2015, they could sign up to be organ donors. So, and in fact, um, it's actually raised donation in Illinois to do this. Well, that's wonderful. Everything. Kristen, this has been very inspiring. Uh, I hope to uh, learn more about what you're doing throughout your career and follow you. Uh, I um, want to also direct our viewers to the Public Health and Social Justice website where you can find numerous uh, open access slideshows, articles, links to uh, important work in public health and social justice. Kristen, good luck in your residency next year. Good luck on your career. And thank you so much for sharing this very important story with us. It's been a pleasure to have you. Thank you for having me, Martin.